Welcome to TRS. We are live. Of his boxing ball fame In this new chapter he's changing the game A kind of vision less violence more heart From the controversial filmmaker A fresh start How is that for an AI generated? <laughs> <laughs> Even the text was AI generated. Great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we just we we generally uh, our uh, co-producer Josh, who couldn't make it with us today. He just tapes in, hey, can you create a song about this upcoming guest on our talk show? We name the talk show, and that's it. He lets AI do the rest. He, he I think he suggested metal for this one, but uh, yeah, oh it's getting, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, I think it fits the theme of the show. You're, uh, I don't know if you're a heavy metal fan, but like it's in enough of your movies. I, I think you have a fondness, perhaps. Um, uh, it depends, right? So, I, I, I like Metallica, I like Rammstein, uh, you know, but I don't like uh, all heavy metal. Yeah, nobody. You know, I mean, of course, ACDC and then so on. I, I went to a Motorhead concert like 30 oh. years ago. And I, at that time, nobody went with earplugs or anything. So I think I, I still have a hearing disability uh, from that, from that <laughs> concert. Let me leftovers. Exactly. Hey, uh, before we get started, I want to do my brief introduction where I badly read words on a screen. Uh, <laughs> Uwe Boll has directed over 35 motion pictures that have starred such acclaimed actors as Sir Ben Kingsley, Jason Statham, Ron Perlman, Ray Liotta, and more. Famous for his work on film and for his work with film critics, we couldn't be more excited for today's guest, Uva Ball. Uva, thank you for spending part of your uh, day with us. It really means a lot that you could give us our, our little show, just some of your time, because we all know who you are. We have all seen and influenced by your movies, and I want to start this interview by saying exactly how I feel, that for better or for worse, TV shows and movies like Fallout would not exist without your work. Uh, getting this all rolling with video games becoming considered uh, a legitimate property for this level of entertainment. So, thank I you. Mean, good. <laughs> you say so. <laughs> uh, there was an article recently in the video game magazine where the guy also wrote, like, I paved the way, right? So, I mean, I got all, for all the criticism and people were losing the shit on me, basically, for because I was the first person who dicked into it and made, I think, five or six films within four or five years based on video games. And that uh, was overwhelmingly uh, stressful for a lot of gamers, I think, at that point. But now it's different. You know, now it's really, it, it comes more and more that people getting it, that games have also great stories and not only yeah. comic books. I mean, it was always the little, the little brother of comic books on the movie screen because all that comic Batman, whatever, Spider-Man, we, we, we grew up with this comic books. But now it's also a new generation. Like my kids don't read comic books but they play games nonstop. So, you know, and that is the thing. It's like it changed. And I think uh, video game based movies will get bigger. Oh, I think absolutely. I can't, I can't wait to see where it goes because I'm, I'm a huge fallout fan myself of the game I've played since uh, actually it was called wasteland on the Commodore 64 in my mind. They're not, they're <laughs> one's a spiritual successor, but I love the whole series and seeing that there's a, a TV series coming out is excited and this is, to me, just the beginning of where it's all going to go. Um, I love it. I love seeing these stories, that these universes be more than just uh, what I was doing in them. Uh, it's great to see. And whenever I, 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 what you were doing, you, you, were, you invented something. And there were people that didn't like the direction you went. I would have done this. I've done that. But you were the guy that took the, had the balls to get up there and say, I'm going to make this into a, a cinematic universe. I'm going to show you what a story here could be like that's yeah i loved it that, that you got there and um like i told you in the the before we started the show postal is uh something i just recently rewatched. and for me um well if i have a question about postal and the first question i really wanted to ask you is uh what's the difference between a duck <laughs> i know <laughs> yeah Lindsay hollister is asking that question in in postal and uh yeah i think postal is not a typical video game based movie in a way no <laughs> it's maybe I the only comedy ever made out of a video game uh and uh it's so crazy like the game 
I think it got the film got the spirit of the game. Um, yep. And um, yeah. I, I remember yeah. like Vince Desi and the, the guys from Running with Scissors, they were in the beginning shocked when I said, no, we need to make this as a, as a ridiculous comedy. We cannot yes. make this just a massacre, like a run amok kind of thing. And I did films right. like this, right, where people running amok, like Rampage uh, and so on. But I felt Postal needs a little more of this kind of um, dark humor and, and everything in it. And I'm very proud that I did Postal. I, I love the film. And I think in today's time, this film would be never... Make, nobody would do this film now because they would be all scared because of the political incorrectness. You know, mm -hmm. you have now so much vogue and so much cancel culture that at Postal, basically after five minutes, you could already cancel everything. And, and it's, I, it's a shame because I'm a big fan of this old comedies like Naked Gun and stuff like this. I love this kind of films and I'm very mad that this kind of films don't get made anymore. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and in fact, uh, and I know you don't like people necessarily to suck up to you through your movies. This being one of my favorite movies, I absolutely think it belongs on the AFI Top 100, or at least as a companion piece to Dr. Strangelove. There is a lot that you packed into this movie that you have to see uh like we look for it it's not it's not it's the non-obvious it is there's a scene where uh, a gunfight where everybody when the camera closes up on who just got shot it's always a kid yeah. and the <laughs> like i got what you were saying i got it but now it's like it, it's almost like idiocracy like that's what we have now the news is concerned with nothing but the glamour shot that gets them the most viewers the uh, uh americans are all overweight every american in the movie by the way completely overweight like it's just you were saying more than idiocracy, and you had the same style of pointing at and laughing at the culture as Dr. Strangelove to me. That's it's not just a funny movie with like some really great scenes in it. I I felt like you were trying to say something in there as well. Whether you were or not, um, I did want to ask, like, how much of that would have been you or your co-author Brian C. Knight in the writing of it? Um, I mean, I uh wrote like I would say 70%. You know, Brian okay. really polished the script, made things better, made also in the scenes uh, stuff and also uh, created uh, a few extra scenes. I think the more harder, more ridiculous stuff is from me. You know, the opening in uh, September 11 and I all that I love the stuff. opening. Yeah. The opening and, tells you what the movie's going to be. There's no surprise. Yes. Like, this is what you're going to get. And it was, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and uh, yes, I agree. It has um, a political side to it in regards of kind of a nihilistic side, right? So you have this kind of, uh, we're getting uh, lies told every day by the media, by the politics, and a lot of things are totally different later, like five, six years later after something happened, things change and the history was not what we thought, you know, and what the people, uh, what we lived in that moment where it happened. And at the same time, also this exactly how you said, like the, the clickbait or the uh, the ratings matter that the the yep. little Germany scene wouldn't work so well if not that journalist is there and she completely doesn't care that all the kids yes, getting hurt exactly because she knows now she will be on national TV based yep. on this massacre and I think that has a lot to like kind of mirroring the situation also what's happening now and what happened five or six years ago already and uh, it was in a way. A little visionary uh because when this was shot was a like lot. 15 16 years ago it was already um i think there it was totally over the top now it comes very close to the reality <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. are in you know similar to my my rampage film where what is also i think very uh visionary in a way like possible civil war everybody flips out all this stuff uh, gets more and more real what what Bill Williamson yes. uh, did in, in, in the Rampage stuff. You know, it's it's in a way scary, but I love it that it's also funny in the film, you know, because yes. you need this kind of um, sarcasm to it, right? So the, the irony and, um, yeah. And I look, for me, it's always like I love it to to laugh about just ridiculous stuff. A lot of stuff what is in TV is too harmless for me. You know, it's like you, you yeah. watch it and you think, yeah, it's maybe some entertaining, whatever, but it's not like 
in a way harsh enough. And and uh, I'm a big Family Guy fan. I'm a big South Park fan. I love these animation shows because they're kind of harder as the the real life uh, stuff. Yeah. You they know, can get away with and, more. Yeah, and Team America was great as the as the theatrical uh, film. Oh, so just brilliant, yeah. just brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. And so, but but that is the thing. So that is why why I think Postal is kind of a total standalone video game based film. Uh, all the other films based on video games are more, of course, action, sci fi, horror. Um, what is also normal, you know. And I think now with Fallout, but also with um, the one on HBO. Um, uh, nah. Boys, Dan. No, the bo- no the boys, not the boys. The the um, the Last of Us it was also uh, the TV series. Yeah. It was also very, very good. I, I really liked it. And I think in a TV series, you basically can flesh out, of course, more the different storylines and the, the overall character. So you get deeper sucked into it as you can do yeah. in film. You know, but when I recently Amazon in Germany released uh, a few of my films um, new, like not new, but again on Prime and they featured them. So in Far Cry was for a few weeks in the top 10 in Germany, Uh, you know, know, like and and the people uh, loved it because it was it's just straightforward action. There's, There's no like what you have a lot now. I think most films now trying to 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 do a love story and a drama and action whatever you know and, and teach I, you something <laughs> we're trying to teach also, you something yes and and it is the thing it's like that moral stuff and whatever and when i'm sitting somewhere and just want to watch an action film i am uh, i don't need this and we also like we grow up with films so you de- you don't need this totally long character development. You know, like when I did the first shift film in New York, the cop film, you have two cops. She just starts there. She comes from Atlanta. She starts in New York. You have the the Brooklyn cop who doesn't want to work with her. Boom. I mean, we all know this kind of stuff, right? So we don't need 15 hours of talk uh, what happened to her before she came to New York. We we just want to see the right. Like we want to see like how it all unfolds. And, um, that is the thing. So I'm I'm a big fan of um, straightforward genre, like what what's now. I have the feeling in in the book, this, uh, in <laughs> well, your microphone fell down. So, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> I love watching his face when stuff like that happens. He's like, oh, I ruined everything. <laughs> yep. But, but I but I like films that they are told straightforward, like the Don Siegel, Sam Peckinpah, all that older directors. They just told a story and you you didn't need a too long of a drama part of it right you know? well look at psycho psycho yeah. really doesn't have a lot of character development despite what it is about characters it's still he's like he jumps right into it here you are pulled up at a hotel something weird is going to happen um you don't learn a lot in fact in most until the end really till the cop interview scene at the end i think where you learn more details than you get did in the movie i think that, it's been a while uh, but yeah, I, I've I did the AFI Top 100, and I've seen a lot of movies, and uh, there are ones that just jump right into it. It's considered some of the best movies ever made, and I think we need more of them because I don't always want to get invested 100 percent in all these details. I want to like let's get moving, let's hear the story in front of us now. I got you got 90 minutes, go. Yeah, but they don't <laughs> have 90 minutes. The problem is also that the films of today are too long. Right, so they, they, I think most of the films now, even like superhero films, why there yeah, are yeah. 150 minutes. I mean, when I when the Transformers, I go a lot of this kind of films because of my kids, right? So, and then I sit there and I think like, oh my God, now another 30 minutes uh, shoot out, fight out, like the Iron Man, <laughs> and whatever. And you feel like why they cannot at least do this films 110 minutes. What yeah. was in earlier years the case, right? So you had barely films that were 120 minutes long when I grew up. They were mostly between 90 and 110 minutes, also because you wanted to play them as many times you can per day. And now if you have like Kevin Costner's Horizon, you, whatever, you, you play that yeah. film twice part a one. day. If you're lucky, you're part one. And then you know, <laughs> there will be three more films like this. And yeah. then 
you know, I mean, that is an extreme, but even the killers of the flower moon and Napoleon and Gladiator, I bet, is also 170 minutes when uh, when it's coming out now, you know, and uh, that is not necessary. I, I think they're wasting a lot of money also with this. This extra hour do do? cost $80 million in this kind of films, you know, and I think it's like, why they do this? It uh, makes no sense for me. I would actually ask you, like, and I know you don't know the answer since you just said that, but like, I never understood it either. Like, is do you get more prestige when it's a longer film? Like, no, it's a two-hour film, so therefore it's you, it's serious, and you should want to come here because we give you all this extra. Versus, hey, sit down, have a good time, have some popcorn. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't know either. I really because I, I, whenever it's a longer movie and the more serious it is, the more I want to get in the right place of mind. I want to sit down, make sure I'm not interrupted. I, I could watch. And that's happened so rarely in my life now that a 90 minute movie that is pure fluff and just fun. I want that more because it's so hard to find now. It's like, I'm watching movies from, I watched silent running, which by the way, you should remake. That is your next, uh, it's early. <laughs> it's seven years before star Wars sci-fi movie that I would love to see redone, but it's, it's almost there it is. for the environmental message. Oh, oh yeah, so, no, that was that was Star Wars. That was Star Wars, not Star Trek. Sorry, uh, Uva. He constantly shoehorns in Star Trek every single episode we do, and I thought you nailed it right there. I was like, "You son of a bitch!" I can't believe it. <laughs> no, I made you do it. <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, I like. I, I just I, I want the simple story. Sometimes I, I appreciate the long stuff. Sometimes, but um, sometimes I want the simple story. The never ending story doesn't need to be never ending. No, and I think. When you, for example, today when we went in uh, Twister, right, and you watch half an hour of advertising and trailers, you know, and then they come with the ice cream inside and offer you ice, you know, like so that means when you have a two and a half. You guys hour get ice cream. Film, what? <laughs> you guys get ice cream in theaters. In Germany, in Germany, it's still like you have an ice cream break after all the trailers are done. The screen stops basically, and the woman comes in with the whole thing. You want a magnum, whatever, but you have to pay it. But now, if you are in a full cinema and she needs like 20 minutes to sell 50 ice cream, oh, geez, right. you get balloony, right? You sit there and you're like, oh my God, who else? Everybody wants ice. So, and that is, of course, you can buy the ice cream too, where you buy before. We had today, we bought the popcorn and three drinks, you know. But then they still come with the ice cream to give the ice cream sales an extra push. But the reality is, then you're at least happy if a film is only 100 minutes long. If the film is 160 minutes, and before this you went through half an hour of like advertising and sales, you never make it out of the movie theater. It's it's just yeah. like it's, it's a total disaster. Oh, and then, probably, you, yeah. you probably showed up 15 minutes early to get a decent seat too. Yeah. No, we have we have buy online. And then you oh, have yeah. it on that has been the greatest thing I is like the fact you can reserve your seat. Uh, somebody, uh, one of our comments, uh, YT McNutt, by the way, nice name. Uh, do you think the length <laughs> of uh, new films is more to do with the prevalence of home streaming versus theatrical viewing? Uh, no. Prevalence of home streaming. Um, yeah, but, but in what way? How he means that? Like, I don't, I don't understand the question in a way. Like, he thinks if, if. Uh, you, you they think if it's longer then they, you're longer in front of your uh, home tv later or what i yeah i don't, I just don't kick, your, kick your shoes off and just call it a day i don't know it's uh he, he, yeah. i think he's saying like the the problems of the movie theater is everything before the movie and then you add the 120 but if you're at home you just start at the 120 mark and you're ready to go do you think that's yeah, why they're making them longer yeah but i have that all the time like when i watch killers of the flower moon i needed four days before I finished it because I was so bored in between that I, I did my emails, you know, I went in the yeah, kitchen. Oh, I got to rewind that. <laughs> you know, and then I came back and they were still talking about how they're all killing, poisoning everybody. You know, and you think like, okay, <laughs> that's the point. You know, like Scorsese uh, should not forget Taxi Driver and films he did early on where he they were 95 minutes long or 100 minutes long. And um, the, the entertaining factor goes away because I think all these directors also, they think longer is better. It's deeper or whatever, but it's not. You know, I, I, I think it's uh, in most of the films, it's just a totally waste of money, time and energy of the audience. Right. And, and, you know, when you would like Napoleon with Joachim Phoenix, well, I think the film was really bad, like really bad from A to Z. And if you tell a story like Napoleon, 
it's not that the audience has no clue who Napoleon is. So you don't have to tell <laughs> us right. his childhood and his problems with his wife or whatever for five and a half hours. Come just straight to Waterloo and let's fight it out. You know, I mean, <laughs> you don't even know how it ends. Yeah. So, and that is the thing. I, I, I don't know why this should be then ending up being a better, uh, a better production. So. Yeah, you brought up Taxi Driver, and for me, that was a perfect uh, what ninety minutes. It, yeah. it was. It could have been longer. He could have explored ten different avenues around, or the character, or the city of New York as a character, whatever it was. We got an intense punch in the face. Like yeah. it was everything was condensed down to this feeling of whatever it gave us, and that's why it was brilliant. And that's why, like you're right. I think like if, if that's the art form. Can you make me feel this much emotion in in this little of time? Scare me with the character, whatever you got to do. You have 90 minutes. Again, it's 90 minutes, go. Uh, so yeah, I, I feel, I think you're 100% on on that and why I generally nowadays gravitate towards the shorter film because I just, I want to see what you can do. What can you do with that? I hear, I'll give you this small, small amount of time. So, um, hey, yeah. I did have one uh, last postal question for you. Um, it, it actually kind of comment kind of question, uh, but I'm a huge kids in the hall fan. And uh, I just want to thank you for including all the screen time you gave to Dave Foley's dick. And I just got to know, was it hard uh, getting him to stop do right it? there? Pause. <laughs> Sorry. Go. No, he did. He, no, no. We never told him to do full nudity. He did. It, it was oh, his decision. Did. And when he got up from the toilet and you see his dick, right? <laughs> we, I was sitting behind my video monitor and I was like, what the fuck is he doing, right? <laughs> I, didn't him. I didn't stop him because the scene in a way was no. perfect. You know, I mean, he's that cult leader and then uh, he's with the four girls in bed and and I mean, it totally fits, you know, so, and what I love totally. in Postal, also we, we had a screening of Postal in, in a German cinema, uh, I think six or se seven weeks ago um, and the people were laughing their asses off. You know, it was like really this kind of freedom feeling for the audience, too, because there were actually people in the audience. They never watched the film and uh, uh, before. And they were laughing a lot because it, it's so ridiculous. It, it does just every scene twists in a different direction, you know, where, yeah. where, where you feel like, you know, when the IRS agents come to the compound and they're everywhere dead Taliban and they completely <laughs> don't care at all. And they're like unauthorized fruit sales <laughs> like, so that's the charge you know like yeah. you think like okay how was it we was domestic terrorism was everybody's dead no nah, and we don't care yeah. we're only here to put, to get taxes so and this is this kind of uh, what you said with the political impact you know it's it's behind this kind of total absurdity and um <clears throat> recently when i when i shot the film run I, I have a WhatsApp group with Kristen Renton from uh, Sons of Anarchy. Uh, she's also yeah, yeah, yeah. In, she's in Run too. And Daniel Soli, he was like in um, The Juice. He played the, the uh, I don't know if you know The Juice with James Franco, that mafia uh, show. Oh, yeah. about and so he was the main bad guy. Like, And he's also in First Shift. And Ulrich Thompson from Festen and Banshee, you know, like this kind of, uh, and we have a WhatsApp group. And we sent us ideas for scenes, you know, and we were, we were laughing our ass off. So we were really on on something like postal in a way, writing scenes. They're so absurd, that, but 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 you have to laugh about it, you know, because it's this kind of, um, for example, I'm in a talk show. I play myself. I will play myself, and completely uh, taking over the talk show, telling everybody that I saw massive flaws in like Akira Kurosawa's films, like Seven Samurai, and yeah. like absolutely classic yeah. Jaws from Steven yeah. Spielberg. And then talking like whatever, like we all know that Kurosawa had no clue from filmmaking, whatever. So, and you know, like that coming from me, and then that I remade Seven Samurai, and then you have only people, non-Asians, playing the samurais, right? And running around. <laughs> You know, they're all talking this Japanese bullshit. And so we are laughing. Was, and that is the thing. That is also a film, of course, when you go now out and would say, I want to make that film, they will they will stop you in the tracks. They would say, like, are you insane? This is racist, whatever, you know. And I we think will it, never sell this in China and Japan if you do that. 
is yeah, going to be hilarious. hilarious. <laughs> and that is the thing. And I think the, the, the good thing in Postal was, and if, if another comedy like this would get made, that it, it needs to break all the taboos. Right, it has to yeah. be like black face, everything. So where the people like normally, you know, because then I think they all calm down if they recognize after five minutes that it's not against gays or against Japanese or against black or against that it's against everything and there yes. are all rules are off the table, you know, then it's funny. You know, I yeah. think then if it's you're going really after one thing, not as much. If you go after everybody, hilarious. <laughs> yes, you know, so and uh <laughs> you know, so I, love, oh yeah. I was going to save this question for later, but I think this is relevant now. You know, there's that one trope, like if you make it animated, it doesn't count, right? You know, you mentioned South Park, you know, Family Guy, they've made all sorts of, you know, uh, social commentary and, you know, with minimal backlash, I would say. And it's been awesome. Um, yeah. Have you ever considered anything animation wise? I mean, just, I yes. know it's probably a lot more expensive, but I mean, that would be crazy. You'd have a lot of freedom on that. Yeah, I, I worked together with an AI company trying something like this because, mm. of course, animation would be great if you can just make it with AI, but it doesn't work. So far, it yeah. doesn't work. It's like uh, comedy needs this still this kind of, and even if it's like when you see South Park, it's not high-end animation, right? Right. At least, right. But, but it's done funny. And the similar yep. to Family Guy, it's all far away from Toy Story or whatever, you know, right, how, right. how it looks like. But you need to do this still like the old fashioned way or it will be not funny. So what the AI came up with was not funny. I wrote, I think, some funny scenes, but it was completely shit, basically, based on the AI voices and the animation. Maybe in gotcha. two three years, it's way easier, you know, mm -hmm. because then I would love to produce a... a uh, an animation film but uh, or animation tv series like this but it would be for, for now if i say i want to do postal as a animation tv series i don't think some streamer will give me the money for it you know they would say like nah no no that is too harsh and then when you start censoring it you destroy the whole production because right. then what is it in the end then it's not funny then everybody is like oh god that was so boring so you know that's that's the problem uh, with this. Yeah. Well, I hope but you I, get there. And if you ever do a crowdfunding, I'm in. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can. <laughs> oh, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> we, but we yeah, first yeah. Would need, like, if somebody listens to this, we would need a real animation studio. You yeah. know, what, what really can animate, like, animation films. They need to partner up with me, you know, and then I can bring the creative Part, the input, the script, and so, so on. But they would need to, to do the drawings. They have to make the animation. Then it could right. uh, work, you know. I mean, look at the the money uh, Family Guy, American Dad, or South Park yep. made. These mm -hmm. are super high-end established money makers for the producers and for the TV channels they, they're airing it. Yeah. Yep. And they stay yep. relevant. I mean, I have to, to give it like the covid uh, South Park episodes that were absolutely dead on. You know, you watch you watch these episodes and you feel like, oh my God, that is how it was. Like people try to be older to go first to the vaccination, right? Five years later, we all think we're dying because we got vaccinated. So, you know, like it's a, this kind of totally insanity. What? But we were all in that situation. I remember we were this all there, yeah. Where uh, uh, my, my brother... Uh, he has a house doctor who va was vaccinating all the retirement homes, right? And my brother like, oh, come over, come over. He's, uh, he, uh, uh, he, uh, he's vaccinating us too. He has like, leftover vaccines, you know? So, and stuff like this, it was really like, uh, like the mafia, the, the COVID mafia. Uh, <laughs> the underground, uh, underground, underground vaccinations, yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. And, and I think that is what, what, uh, what especially South Park, did amazing episodes also now on Ozempic, <laughs> you know, like this kind of stuff. Everything what yeah. is really happening, South Park is re it's reacting to it very fast and very fast. And I have no idea how they stay that sharp after all these years. I like just they're they're still almost as fearless. I say almost um, for a reason. I th I think they have toned down a couple things here and there. Just to, yeah, like the Muhammad thing, or they've pulled back on on some things, but. And they still stay sharp and they still are mostly fearless. And I think that's really hard whenever there's, they're now in bed with billionaires. 
you know, like, hey, your product, it, we we depend on you. You have to do what we say. Like, there's a lot of pressure pro- to to do X, Y, and Z. I think even if they say they never say a word to us, uh, so I have no idea how they stay that sharp. I don't. It's it's impressive. But I think they're so rich now that they also don't care. Yeah, they can. Right? So they can I, say, I, we'll I, walk away. I don't care. Them, or you cannot do this. And they laugh all the way to the bank. If they <laughs> if they take that South Park off and just put it on YouTube, they they will make millions in advertising on YouTube also. Yep. You know, like like if they don't show it anymore, uh, uh, where are they? Par, par, no, where are they? Paramount Plus or where? It's Paramount. Comedy right? Central. I don't know what the the pay channel is now. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, so it's not that they need uh, this deal to make money with, with, with South Park. And I, I agree. I think it's uh, it's hilarious. And also they do, in a way, what Postal did too, they do that meta thing after, right? So they, they do whatever. They have Cartman dressed as Adolf Hitler at Halloween, right? And then they're like, you cannot do this. And then they want to teach him how bad Hitler was. And he, they show him yes. all the films. And then he's a total fan. He loves it and wants to see it again. <laughs> right? and, and so I, and then, but that is that is when things getting funny. You know, like, yeah. like uh, and, and then a lot of comedies, they don't have this next step, you know, that you go with it. And I think with, with Postal, when we did the September 11th thing, saying is, of course, like, uh, you have that set up. And it's like the, the audience was like right off the bat, like, oh, oh what, September 11th, what is this, right? And then they're actually getting in that fight about the virgins, you know? And it's all about like, <laughs> uh, wait a second. How getting, many are you getting? Yeah, 99. He told me 98. So if it's 98, maybe it's only 16. And then like, the running out. Virgins, and he said, how many virgins do you want? And he said, yeah, about 16 virgins. How long there will be virgins? They will be not a long time virgin, so we're totally fucked, right? And then they call Osama bin Laden to ask him, and he said, "We're running out of virgins. It's looking really bad, and, and they don't want to. They want to fly to Hawaii." So, but but that is comedy, you know, like this. Yeah, is and it like, kept coming back. It took place over different scenes in the movie. Over like it was. It started at minute ten. You came back to it at minute thirty, and then at the end, it was an even bigger joke with Osama. Like, yeah, uh, that you revisited, like you were talking about with South Park. Yeah, but I didn't revisit the, the September 11. That airplane was no, no, yeah, yeah well, but 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 well. Osama bin Laden comes back, and that was also like you remember that the bin Laden family was the only airplane what left America. Yes, I and do. The bin Laden family in 24 hours after the attack left America because they did with Bush all that year's de- uh, deals, right? So, I mean, yeah. they, they, I mean, supposedly they have nothing to do with Osama bin Laden's terror attacks, but is that not like a coincidence? Like, think about this, how absurd that is, that a, a family, the president of the United States makes deal with, by accident has a son who turns into the biggest terrorist of, of all times. I mean, it is, you cannot make that up. If you would make that up, everybody would say, that is so unrealistic that, you know, it's... Yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I felt the same way. Uh, hey, but I did want to get off postal. Yeah, I just yeah, yeah. I, because you know there's a lot of ways the ways we this conversation can go. Um, but I did want to get off. Uh, we have to talk about the the thing. Everybody, not everybody, but probably some people in the chat are interested in hearing about. We got to touch on the boxing thing. So Kevin Smith made a, a film, a part of his film about going out and beating up the critics, and you actually went out and did it. You fought five different critics. You beat all five of them. And one question I did have for you is, as somebody who knows how to fight, and you clearly know how to fight, everybody is one lucky punch away from losing a fight. Were you prepared to lose one of those fights? Did you mentally prepare? Like, what if I lose? No. No. Uh, I mean, the the thing is, uh, I never saw these guys before they came to Vancouver, right? So I had no clue how they looked like. It was not like uh, Jeff Schneider from Variety uh, how much he weighs, how tall he is. I had no clue till they came. And uh, then, I mean, it's exhausting to beat five people up. You know, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> that's such a badass thing to say. I'm, Spielberg's not saying that. <laughs> like, that's such an it's, awesome thing. It's still like, even if you win, right? So it's, it's still exhausting to beat them up. And I really uh-huh. trained hard. I, I mean, I boxed when I was young, but I was like 10 years not, not in boxing training. And then I really... Uh, during we shot postal was during the, the shooting. I uh, sparred every day with uh, our stunt coordinator at Anders, who was a Thai boxer. So for like weeks and weeks, 
we did sparrings and we were not like giving us a lot. So we were like sometimes at nose bleeding, you know, blue eyes. So right. we really yeah. went for it because I wanted to be uh, prepared. And I think when you, when you did fight sports when you were young, you know, the hardest thing is to get the toughness back. You know, it's 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 really like to to take shots and to to just uh, adjust to it. If you just go in the ring and you get hit the first time and you never got hit, it's a very disturbing situation. But you can get totally used to it if if you do a, a fighting sport. So sure. and that is what I had to get back. So for me, then it was clear that nobody will fight like at Anders. You know, the, the, for me, it was clear whoever comes here cannot, like, it's not on that level. He was really strong and, as I said, was a stunt guy. So, um, and that was it was the thing what calmed me down, you know. And I think it was a great e evening, a great event. It was a lot of fun. So too. Doing it. Uh, few of them changed their opinion about me after, what was good yeah. also. Yeah. And it was, was awesome. that it's brain damage they have now. <laughs> <So> <laughs> <laughs> it changed now. <laughs> and, uh, I was you know, expecting. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and, I mean, so there were a lot of directors. Uh, they were very. Uh, they loved it. You know, I know. Yeah, uh, like, it's a dream for so many people. Time, you know? Yeah, because a lot of directors have this kind of. Oh God, I wish I could beat some uh, critics up. Yeah. yeah. Everyone, everybody, like it, it's. I remember hearing that news and just kind of going. And then exactly yeah, what Hammond exactly. said. I was like, I was like, you have to have the onus to like sit down and be like, all right, if I lose one, but it's like, I can't imagine any of them being in that situation where they're like going to be as prepared as you are. So it's just, it was just nice to hear like, hey, you're doing that and uh, you want all of them. So everybody wants to be in that role. Everybody wants to take on, you know, their nemesis in some way, you know, whether it be a lighthearted smashing of the face or otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, of course. And, and the uh, best thing is when they agree to it. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. It was, uh, and then coming out, you know, friends? Question mark afterwards. Like, well, that was my next question. Are you friends with any of these people now? Like, have, did it become a relationship? Hey, we did something cool and, and together. Yeah, I, I stayed in contact with Chance Minter, and later yeah. when I made a, a short movie, he helped me in L.A. He lived in L.A. Now he's back. I think he's in Minnesota or something. He's out of the film business. But Jeff Snyder, I talk, uh, I talk regularly with from uh, Variety. And he said, so when he came back to the office in L.A., every single computer had as a screensaver him throwing up after the fight. That's beautiful. That's <laughs> so beautiful. So they all put it up. Like he was like, Bleh. And, yeah. uh, they, and they got the <laughs> mask on. And uh, though they gave him a lot of uh, <laughs> shit based on this. And that was good. But he took it with humor, right? So I met him yeah. later. Uh, in I think at the American film market, and he was all uh, all okay and fine with it. For them, it was also a hardcore experience, you know. And uh, things yeah. like um, different as their normal life is, and I think they will also never uh, forget it. Yeah, I, I, and it was a moment. I, I I know it was a lot of press, but it was, it's actually a moment in cinema cinematography history or whatever that. You know, like at this one time, a director's like, all right, let's do something about it. And it, it, I thought it was an interesting story the whole way through from from the first challenge to he's doing it. I remember like when it was like, this is happening. I, I remember that moment going, I can't. This is cool. Um, yeah. So I was alive for something like that to happen. It was, it was it, neat. Um, it should happen more often. It's a lot of fun. It should happen more often. Like, you know, just Spielberg just up there, like throwing punches on some little 14 well, year old blogger. M. Night Shyamalan just uh, released a new movie, so you know maybe he doesn't like what's said in Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> it's a good bet. Um, <laughs> the uh, hey, since we have everybody kind of hooked here, I want to move on to your upcoming films because you have recently unretired from directing, and uh, I don't know if you also retired from writing, but you're back in the director seat with First Shift, uh, which is getting a wide release in September. Correct? Uh, yeah, beginning of September. Uh, it, what can you tell us about it? Yeah, so uh, we well, touched on it, but yeah, so I had like basically how first shift what I wrote to uh, came together was I developed over time. I write always ideas down, like if I have a good idea for something, but it, a lot of times that doesn't end up in uh, ninety minutes, you know. So whatever, uh, and I had like two or three of the little episodes of first shift. I basically had them together, but 
was the whole time thinking, okay, but then it's not a film. But then I felt at one point, but what is if I make it a cop film and the lead actors are the cops and we go with them from case to case to case. And my little stories are these cases, what they went through the, in that day when they do the cop work. You know, one is like an old guy gets a heart attack and they get him out of the supermarket to the hospital and his dog is still like tied up in front of the supermarket. And when he's in the hospital, the cops come in, Gino Pizzi, and then they tell him, the old guys tell him, my dog, my dog is still in the supermarket when they roll him into emergency, you know? And now Gino says, oh God, where's the cop? And he's like, the supermarket, whatever he says, he gives him like the kind of a location. So he takes the dog, he goes and get the dog. And then for the rest of the film, he has that dog in his car, you know, like, so, so I did like little episodes, but they're all overall in that, in that story where you have two cops that have to work together the first time and you know and she's okay. all about you know they go to luigi's bagel place and she is gluten-free you know and he like oh my god you know eat a tomato you know like so all this stuff where these two personalities uh crash you know okay. and she's like, there on the brooklyn bridge and she's like it's almost traffic like in atlanta right and then gino is like are you insane you want to compare New York with Atlanta? And she's like, why not? And she said, Atlanta is shit. <laughs> like, like, and, and so, but stop. So it's very dry humor, you know? And I'm, I'm very happy with the two actors because they really pulled it off. Like uh, Kristen and, and Gino, there was the, the chemistry is just there. And so it's a lot of this kind of funny scenes inter, interrupted with this kind of, there's a mafia killing where, a kid gets killed and then the mafia boss basically kills the killers, you know, because uh, he knows the cops will not go over this. They will, they will track them, they will get them. And he doesn't want that they can raid him out. So he let the killers right. get killed. So stuff like this, you know, uh, so it's kind of harder police stuff. It's an R rated film, but uh, at the same time, it has a lot of uh, humor and, um, it doesn't have, because we didn't have the money, this kind of like endless car chases like bad boys or something. So this you will not have uh, in the film, but you have solid action. Cool. I'm tired of car chases. Uh, just, just I, I don't know how to do, like if somebody said, hey, make a film with a great car chase, I would not uh, one up what's already been done. I think that, that would be a tough challenge to even conceive of doing a better car chase than what somebody's already done. So I don't know. I'm fine with that. I, I like the day in the life story of, how do these two eventually mesh or not? It sounds way more interesting to me than another car chase. So, um, I mean, there's a little car chase in my film, but it's not. I, I was, but the, when no, you talk, I mean, but when you talk about, I, car, I mean, the ninety minute just nothing but car chase. Ryan Reynolds did a movie that's nothing but a car chase, and I enjoyed it for what, because they did that. But I don't, I, I don't need it twice or three times in a movie to get me back into thinking about it. Is I said, I'm flying to Pennsylvania and boxing Nathaniel's feelings about car chases. So uh, be prepared. I'm going to box you over it. No, I've car, car chases are awesome, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, but that is the same, but there, there's a, there's a whole new subject that we can talk about. If you see Ronan, that was a car chase. They did yeah. it for real, right? So now you see the last Fast and the Furious films and it's all bullshit. And that is the yeah. thing. When they started, oh, yeah. when they started changing everything into fake car CGI stuff. Yes. I, I, I don't want it. I like car chases where you have the feeling these are stunt drivers actually doing it and you have. This oh, absolutely. Of, uh, is it, you know, yeah. Is it fair to say, like, and again, just as a director, this isn't a. Uh, is it fair to say, like, this stuff has become so CGI driven and practical effects are almost gone at this point? It's just safe. It, a car chase is safe. There's no real damage. It's just real. There's nothing to it. We become desensitized to it because you're seeing cars essentially have superpowers, you know? And it, instead of like back in the day, you'd see cars, real cars lined up and like being, you know, uh, yeah. actual parts of the plot, essentially. Now it's just CGI, shatter CGI. Uh, 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 next scene comes up, more CGI. I don't know. I don't even know what I'm saying, but. <laughs> yeah, look at the first bad boy stuff. Look at the first Fast and the Furious film. Yeah. The old, the old James Bond films had always an amazing real car yeah. chase, uh, amazing stuff. 
And now when you watch all of this, you think these are normal people, like they are not superheroes in Fast and the Furious or in Bad Boys, these are humans, but they are now superheroes. Yeah. You know, Vin yeah. Diesel can fall down from a skyscraper yeah. on his foot and he has nothing. And you think, uh, why are you not dead? So and wow. <laughs> I started, I hate this kind of films now. I, I'm a big fan of uh, Die Hard, you know, of all that franchise when they started. I actually yeah. uh, liked the new Beverly Hills Cop film more as I thought, you know, because the car chases in that film looked real they were they were not okay. bad they were really yep. well made and it was unbelievable what they what they pulled off there so i'm i expected i hate the beverly hills cop film i expected to hate I, it and then I, I watched, everybody's talking I was, nice I, things I was about it yeah. surprised. we what? were just talking about before this uh this show actually before we recorded how pleasantly surprised how much they nailed it you know it's yeah. uh yeah you know i haven't so, seen it yet and he was talking me into it so all right no, because I was I mean, thinking, oh, I do everything fake, everything CGI, whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I it's think just, that might be it for me. Yeah. Yeah. Bring that, back practical effects, guys. Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, I was going to go into a, a whole big thing about uh, Burt Reynolds. I think Hooper had a big stunt in it where he wrote, <laughs> drove under a smokestack that was falling down. It was all timing and people really could have died. Uh, like that, I remember even as a kid going, that's amazing because it's a real person in a real car with a real tower of bricks falling right in front of them or after them. Um, but I did want to talk about something else from childhood. I grew up uh, about an hour and a half away south of Pittsburgh. And about another 10 minutes south of Pittsburgh is where your lead actor, uh, Gino Pessi, grew up. And I'm just blown away that somebody from this small town, middle of nowhere kind of upbringing is in your next movie. Uh, what was it like working with him? No, he was the first I want to get him on the show. For first shift. So... But for first shift, I did a, a, a basically a casting call, and to my big surprise, because he has big, uh, big parts like uh, 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 Shades of Blue with Jennifer Lopez, he was the second lead, you know, like so. And I was like, send him an email and say, "Oh, you applying to play in my film?" But I mean, look at your credits, like <laughs> you know, you <laughs> normally see you know, people apply who basically don't have so big credits. And then we started talking on WhatsApp, and uh, and he said he is. Uh, by the way, he is. I think in the film office in Pittsburgh now. He's working as an actor, but also for the film commission or something. And uh, he said he left Hollywood because he couldn't stand it anymore. He, he, he couldn't stand the vogue, the cancer culture, this political correctness. And he looks out for more kind of different uh, productions. And he felt my thing came across very uh, real. And then we basically developed a lot of things of his character and uh, Angela's character, Kristen Renton, um, together. You know, so and we had long uh, chats on on WhatsApp to get it right. And uh, he was absolutely helpful with developing um, the the film in a in a way. You know, and I always like I did that with the the run film, what I just shot in Croatia too. Like. I look at the actors and then I change the role and the script that it fits to the actor. Because a lot of times I you cannot you know, you know, when I had now Amanda Plummer in Run, it's like Amanda Plummer is not Jennifer Lopez, right? So, and when I wrote Run, it was also not Jennifer Lopez in my mind, but it was still different as Amanda Plummer, you know? And then you have Amanda Plummer and you need to build her str strong acting side out, What what how she acts, you know, this kind of right, right. nervousness and uh, a little like spaced away, you know, like where you, where you feel like um, that could totally work. You know, and I, I like that to do that with actors and a lot of actors really like it that I I've give them, a lot of you know, that you say, look, if you want to do it a little different. And uh, I also tell my actors always, like in this case, Gino and Kristen, I said, look, you tell me where you grow up. You know, like like uh, my film is about 12 hours. It's all in one day. But you should think about, I tell you, you come from Atlanta. It's your first day in Brooklyn. But you tell me why you are here. That And Kristen developed that all on her own. Why she left, 
you know, okay. uh, and came to New York. And I like this. I, I think that's the whole point of making films is also to work closely with the actual actors uh, you have. And then uh, as long as story stays, uh, you know, I'm totally open that they put their own ideas in. That's collaboration. That's that's what I like doing with with uh, Zaz down here and Josh. Like we collaborate and we come up with something. And as much as I'm behind an idea, this is my idea. I want to make it go. I'm like, well, you guys are working with me. I want. This is why we do it. This is why we're all together is to have the best best outcome. So I love that, and I've read that about you. You've been doing that your whole career, as yeah. far as, as far as I'm aware. Like you work with the actors on. What yep. do you think? Okay, I'll listen to you. And uh, so you're from what I know, you're known for that, which is an amazing. And semi rare thing. Yeah, but you need the right film too, right? You cannot do this in Alone in the Dark because then you have a script that everything gets planned, the stunts, the CGI. You have right, like as, right. as more, let's say, technical it gets because you make a horror film or you make a sci fi film or something, it's tougher to give them that room. You know, you develop yeah. like yeah. five. Oh, yeah, of course. Five monster and they say we don't want the monster you say no but the monster will happen uh, <laughs> you know like <laughs> it's, it's then a different thing right so but if uh if if she is a vegan and you know like as a gluten-free vegan that she came up with this because she felt like that is a good idea for comedy right and gino loved that because he said i hate vegans and i hate uh, uh, gluten-free like gluten. he's a pittsburgh no was ever, no was ever gluten Nobody had an allergy 25 years ago. You know, like it's this kind of thing. Like it always started, and now now everybody asks you for allergies wherever you go. You know, and that is it's so absurd, especially when you're European. Like when you go in Germany in a normal restaurant, let's say you go in a super high end restaurant, they ask you for it. But in, nobody in Germany would ever ask you for an allergy because they don't care. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. You know? You want the Wiener Schnitzel? Okay, here is it. And I, the, if you really have an allergy, you better tell them. You say, oh, I cannot have eat nuts or whatever, right? So, but normally I, I feel this in, especially in Los Angeles or in New York. And so it's very annoying that, you know, like this kind of, that it's an endless list of all of this is in our food. Every menu is like 50 pages now. And then they ask you for the, for the allergies, whatever, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. It's, I I understand exactly where you're coming. I, I am fortunate to not have any allergies except the bees. Like if you have bees in your restaurant, I'm gonna have a problem. But uh, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that just was so random. All right, yeah, yeah. maybe I, yeah. some spied bees. Because I'm not I, gonna go to yeah, I'm not gonna go to a churrascaria as a vegan. I'm not a vegan, but I'm saying like it just for me, it's uh, I get some things, but it's just the overall when they're like you know do you, you know you're I'm in an ice cream place like do you have anything non dairy? No. What? Yeah, where, yeah. where have we had a good? Like, get out. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we're we're running a little bit low on time, but I did want to get on to uh, run and specifically, uh, what is that movie about? And where did you come up with that idea? What made you go with this project? Yeah. So run is more uh, for me, uh, kind of a political uh, film, but it's also playing in one day, similar to first shift. A lot of my films, I like to have this kind of tense situation and we all know like illegal migration is huge in europe and in america so there are real problems and uh, i see it here in germany we have massive problems with uh, uh, people from afghanistan syria a lot of knife stabbings a lot of um, that it's it, like basically i think we had over twenty thousand assaults from migrants in one year in germany uh, you know, where you have like people dead, people heavily wounded, uh, right. a woman raped. So, and we have to, we have two politics, right? So it's similar to the US. And I think we need like common sense in general when it comes to this, you know, we cannot have too much migration because it throws everything completely off. And we can also not act like a mass migration from in, in, in Europe, from Islamic territories is so easy. Is you know that they all come in and blind blend in when you lift in yeah, Afghanistan. Yeah, like, yeah, welcome. We're we're, yeah, we're exactly like you. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. not working. And so and I felt okay, so have an Italian beach town where every day that refugee boats coming in, and we have James Russo, Ulrich Thompson, and Kristen Renton, they live there, so they have a boat rental, 
And it's the business went to shit because the tourists are not coming anymore. When you actually know this is one of these uh, uh, islands in front of Italy, you know, La Lampedusa, uh, by Sicily and so on, where they're coming. And so they don't want the refugees, and but they're coming. And then you have Daniel Soli and uh, so a few uh, Italian guys there. They are the police. They transfer and and uh, basically when the refugees coming with the boat they're all trying to run away and a few getting catch and amanda plummer is basically an, a tourist too and she helps a senegal pregnant girl so she takes her in her hotel room and later the brother from that woman from the pregnant woman she wants, she calls her brother, he's already illegal there and illegal working. So he wants to pick her up, but the Italian cop basically catches them. So he takes the pregnant woman to put her in the camp, basically. And then Amanda Plummer wants to bribe the police officer, you know, and he says, mm, 2,000 bucks, and I let her go. And then she goes to the bank, she gets only a 1,000 bucks out and gives him a 1,000 bucks, and he takes the money, but doesn't let her go. He just takes the money and Amanda Plummer is very right. mad about it, you know, and so and it's all these parallel stories uh, coming uh, uh, out. Barkat Apti from Captain Phillips, the guy who yes. was for Oscar, he is one yep. from Somalia. He's on the boat. He wants political asylum. And so he is not running away. He goes straight in the camp to file for political asylum. And um, so we follow all of this. But then one uh, refugee basically um, takes a hostage and the situation completely escalates with dead people and James Russell's daughter, get or Chris okay. Renton, the daughter from James Russo. So she gets arrested and they go for it. Basically, they attack everybody. So it's, it's, it gets very bloody in the end. It's an Uwe Boll film. So I, yeah. I uh, you know, I'm not doing, <laughs> I'm not doing this lighthearted uh, uh, film. <laughs> But for me, the, 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 the overall message is that it's a lose-lose situation also for the refugees because they pay 20,000 yeah. 20, bucks to smugglers. A lot of them, them die on the ocean, you know, like they're getting thrown off board, the, board, the, the, the rubber boats sink all the time. So they, it's, very, it's very risky. And they're getting lied to. They, get, they, they said to them, like, if you go to Europe, you get rich. You know, and then they're coming to Europe and they're getting in a camp and nobody wants them, you know, like, and this is how it is. Yeah. So it's a lose lose situation. Um, but what I hate, uh, even if we're not a political podcast, but what, what I what I hate is when you actually see the productions about the subject migration from the TV channels and streamers, they are so vogue. They only show films where you think that refugees are the best people in the world. Sure. You have always that winner stories. The refugee comes and she will be running in the Olympics in the end. The refugee comes and he works for the NASA in the end. That are the stories they're telling. And that is so wrong. You know, that is one out of a thousand. Most of them have no qualification whatsoever, no school, whatever. They cannot... Like like we in Germany, we have a very big problem and we need more people into Germany, right? But we don't need people from the a little town in Afghanistan. You know, we need people that can work at VW or Mercedes uh, or, you know, like or, or, or real big companies. We need qualified people coming into Germany. And our politics in Germany, especially our government right now, is so bad. They tell us all the time, like, yeah, we need people. And everybody about <laughs> right? so and they said, oh, but as, uh, we whatever, we make them then uh, they they we educate them, but they don't. The reality is we we started this with with Merkel 2016 when we took 1.2 million Syrian people in, 1.2 million in, in a few months, right? And now we have 1.4 million people from Ukraine plus four or five million people, Afghanistan, uh, uh, Senegal, Somalia. So it is too much. You know, it's too much. The schools don't know how to teach if you have like five. Right, especially if you're not giving them an entry into being part of the community. Like here's how, assimilation. Like here's yeah. education. Here's, here's what we expect here for work. Here's what you need to have to do X, Y, and Z. If you're not preparing that, if there's no organized situ situation, 
I can't imagine like I can't imagine the problem with that. And I wish I can't imagine uh, leaving my country with nothing else, barely making it, getting there, and then hey, now good luck. You don't speak the language. You don't know anybody. You don't know how to even like interview for a job, and you're supposed to survive. And I just I wish that if if the, there was going to be immigration like this on any level, that it came with a welcome packet of information, <laughs> knowledge, integration, like. This is what our community is like, and this is how you're expo- expected to, to act. Um, yeah, but that would be having the infrastructure to support that. I mean, and the yeah. infrastructure to do that. Yeah. You know, that's the infrastructure. You cannot yeah. have people, like, for example, let's say you have a school class with 25 kids, and you have three people in that class who don't speak English or don't speak German. You can integrate them slowly but steady, right? But if you have 10 kids from 25, from four different languages in Africa, this school class goes to shit. You know, because right. they get nothing done, nobody understands anything, and then you have that infrastructure problem. And the same with adults, when you when you have one guy coming in and you put them in a in the workforce or he learns a trade or something, then you know, then you can teach this guy slowly but steady how to yeah. do it. But if you have 10 people, you know, getting getting like, okay, you work now here for the plumber company and the plumber company has only five real plumbers and now you have 10 refugees. This whole company will go under because they can't, you, you cannot handle it. So the infrastructure can handle only as much people, you know, and that is the thing where, where um, I have always the problem. I see facts for facts and I'm not left or right. You know, yeah. like that is the thing I don't care about. I, I think the old idea, somebody's right, somebody's left, that doesn't really work anymore. You have to see the problem by problem. And some yep. problems uh, is, uh, on some things I'm more on the right side when you when you say sure. things, on other things I'm more on the left side. But um, the fact is we need to, to attack the subject matter, how the subject matter is. And when the U.S., I'm, I mean, I'm, of course, uh, reading the news every day in the U.S. too. And what happened I'm at sorry. the border is a disaster. It is too much. It is too much illegal migration into the U.S. And it has to get stopped, period, right? And it is the same, it, it's the same in Europe. That means not that nobody's welcome anymore, That you know, that, but, but at one point, uh, it's, uh, the, the infrastructure cannot handle it. And, right uh, so, and that, that is the thing. And as soon as somebody says something like this, he is in Germany at least, then uh, directly a right wing, you know. And okay. you, yeah, but, but, but you know, the, the, the thing is, and I totally refuse basically in all that, in all the years, about political discussions um, in a way to, to take a side. It's better Same. To, see, Same. to see where what, what, the, what the situation is. Right when when you see the Ukrainian war, uh, we have 1.4 million Ukrainians now here, mostly women with kids, right? And when you think, okay, their husbands, they're maybe already a lot dead, and uh, you know we're very welcoming them, you know, like and and I'm, of course, but the reality is, all our power should go towards to finish that war. You know, because people, you cannot make a life again, but buildings you can rebuild. You know, so, and what we see here in the last two, two and a half years, what I feel is that there is not even a serious attempt to finish that war. It's only Zelensky uh, travels around the world, wants more money and more weapons, you know, and uh, at the same time, they're making a peace conference with 80 countries, but without Russia. You know, it's like having a Floyd Mayweather fight without Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> without Floyd Mayweather yes. <laughs> you know, it's like totally absurd. And like, how can you have a peace conference where everybody talks about something, but the, the two war parties is only one guy here. So, and that is the thing where where um, I feel... Um, I feel some of it's performative? It, you think some of it's performative? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's kind of, I have the feeling like, uh, in, especially in Germany, the Green Party, is now they turned into warmongers. They they totally excited about that war, and they let the Ukrainians die with you know like giving them money, giving them weapons, whatever, and they let them 
do a fight what they cannot win in the end. In the end, you, the Ukraine cannot win the, the war against Russia. It will never happen that Russia gives up and, and is uh, whatever, Ukraine moves into Moscow and takes Russia, whatever. All of this can never happen. The maximum what can happen for Ukraine is to fight endlessly. And we know from Afghanistan, we know from Vietnam. We learned a lot there. It's the worst disaster ever. You know, like when you, in retrospective, that Vietnam war should be like, they should pull everybody out two years in and Afghanistan the same. It was a senseless money and life spent for 20 years or 15 years, however long it was. And I, I feel like um, the the price to, to be in the trenches and to get killed is too high for a few cities that are already in rubble. So, uh, you know, I mean, they're all totally destroyed in the South. And uh, so, you know, and you cannot win. It's like Putin and Russia is not the Yemen or, you know, or the Hezbollah. They are the biggest at atomic superpower in the world. And they will not, like, just move away and give everything back to the Ukraine and give them the, the Krim where they have the harbor. They will not do it. So why not then... In that one thing, I have to say, I hope for Trump in that one thing, to be honest, is that he said, and I hope that no matter if Trump gets elected or Kamala Harris or whoever, but at least he says, I will finish that war. I want to finish that war. And I don't hear that from any other politician. Like in Europe, nobody says that. Everybody in Europe says, no, we have to support the Ukraine, that they win the war. But everybody, every military, military strategist and I listen a lot of podcasts here with real military uh, strategists, like uh, people from the German army and so they really looking into the details of that war. And they say the Ukrainians are slowly losing. It's oh, yeah, that's, that's some of the headlines death. here too. Yeah. Yes, it's a slow death. So if with this information, you need to tell Zelensky, look, uh, we want to help you making this getting away. And without you flying out of uh, Kiev in the end, you know, with the helicopter bye-bye, like the right. guy from Afghanistan. You remember the Kazai guy, the president from yeah. Afghanistan? He was with 30 million in cash. He was in Dubai before the Taliban took over. That happens then, right? So, And I think it's not fair what Zelensky is doing to his own people. And uh, uh, I, I think now it's the time to make a deal with Putin to get it over with. And of course, you have to lift the sanctions. Of course, you have to give them a few cities and the Krim. Yeah, it's too bad. But I think we as a NATO, we have a good chance to protect then the Ukraine after. You know, if Putin uh, gets basically almost his way, then the price he has to pay for it is that the Ukraine is then, let's say, maybe not part of the NATO, but the NATO gives a full security guarantee. So that Putin knows one more tank going now over this new border, the whole NATO will attack and we bomb Moscow and not only the tank who yeah. went over the border. So if he gets that message, I think there is a good chance that the peace will hold up, you know, and uh, it's um, it's it's ridiculous. You know, it's like my son is here in school and he, uh, he has uh, four or five kids from Ukrainians there and they are sometimes... Uh, you know, they're really depressed. They don't know where their father is. They have no contact to them and so on. I mean, it's, you know, it's always easy to talk about war as long as you're not in the, in the trenches. Yeah. I think, I think with the war ending, uh, it's bad news for Putin if they let it end, because that's when the accounting starts coming into play. How much did we spend? How many lives did we lose? How many prisoners did we let go that should never really go? He's going to have to deal with that at the end of the war. And I think that's going to hurt him more in his own country. I'm just saying, if that Daniel, you're, su you're such a goddamn nerd. You're just like, okay, guys, listen, it's the numbers. What's our ROI on this? It's always numbers. It's always <laughs> like, numbers. It's always I love numbers. It. When people find out they lost 1.4 million neighbors. Oh, I was going to say. Right now, that, no, that information is not getting out right. within Russia as much. So I'm like, right. that will start to get out, uh, especially yeah. as people cross those borders. What's your um, yeah, we're running out of time. Yeah, uh, but I'm I not. I, 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 first of all, I have time. So I'm. I've oh, okay. Oh, okay. It's good. So we, we don't have to finish it right now, but because I think it's an interesting conversation, right? So, and um, I think, um, you know, the, the, the situation is 
you can only change a country from the inside long term. A Putin will only go if it's enough for the Russian population. You know, in the very, the very end, it's them who will take him out. You know, there are so many Russians flying out of the windows every every week in, in the washing. I would you know, never go on the second accident. floor. By accident, there's all people, they hate Putin. They're falling out of the window left and right in Moscow. So, and, you know, but at one point, maybe he flies out of the window. We, You don't know when it's over. It's over. You know, but I know that the war is weakening the economy in Russia. I know that a lot of people are not happy about the hundreds of thousands of Russians who are dead. And uh, I think in his... Uh, uh, highest interest is also to finish the war you know mm-hmm. but you cannot say what they said the whole time biden said the whole time uh, we will negotiate with putin after he removed all his troops out of ukraine and that is the most absurd line i ever heard i mean like when you move away the war is over for what you want then uh, to negotiate the whole point is of course that he holds his territories and then negotiates, you know, like, I mean, nobody moves away and declares the war is over. And then you start negotiating about the war is over. It doesn't make yeah, any sense, yeah. you know, but, but that is the thing. It's like, uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, yeah, very, very mad about this situation. And everybody in Germany who says that what I just said is a Putin lover. You know, like yeah, the I love that. Germany and the, the public media, they, they say... Uh, but if you want peace, ah, you're on Putin's side. Uh, Uva, I'm not, I'm not messing with you when I say this. Literally, right before the show, we were just talking about being, you know, uh, left and right, and it's like how you can have some ideas from the left or right, you know, conservative or you know, otherwise. And it's like if you step, if you say one thing, like, well, I like, I like firearms, I like ownership of firearms. So it's like, well, immediately, like you, you're, you're, you're completely red pilled, or you're not, you're anti liberal. It's like. Can I just have a little for both? Can I have my own thoughts? I don't want to yeah. take Do I have from to be one. Part of that? I'm not a cookie cutter. These are thought. These are issues that are complex. They don't have a simple solution. We need to go through it. You know, I made a joke about accounting, but like, I mean, there are some thought. There is thought process behind these pieces financially. Um, you know, we we're talking about infrastructure and immigration. It's not as simple as going. This is bad or this is good. It's like you have to have ideas but you have to have action plans to go with these ideas. I'm not going to just be a lefty or a righty. I'm sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean to go on a rant, but you touched on something that was really important there. No, and you're, you're, I think you, you nailed it. You know, and I think also uh, take the, take the COVID. Um, I got vaccinated. My kids not right. Even if they said the kids should get vaccinated, I never saw the point for them that they should get vaccinated. And uh, with all, because BioNTech, who did with Pfizer the vaccine, is in Mainz, like my hometown. So uh, since they made 20 billion bucks on the vaccine, they hired 5,000 more people and built three more buildings here in Mainz. You know, like the city of Mainz loves BioNTech. Uh, But I think overall, uh, you have to be realistic. In retrospective, the vaccines were shit. I mean, you know, like because they were only holding up for three months. They the only thing what the vaccine did is it helped you not to die, you know that that you don't get a, a very bad COVID. Maybe you know. So, but I think in retrospective, um, there was a lot of mistakes. There was a lot of damage done closing all the schools. A lot of the kids they were never really in danger. They were, you know, like but they got very depressed and very very. Uh, uh, yeah, under stress. Um, I, I saw that with my own kids. And uh, I would say, I would never say it was idiotic to have the vaccine. I I think it was the, at that point in time, the vaccine was the hope for everybody to get out of the lockdown, you know. So, but I personally felt never, I was never scared to die of COVID. You know, because I looked at the numbers and everything. And when you really look to die on COVID, uh, that that was not like. And, and now when people like now, when, when Biden said he has COVID, he has to self-isolate. I have to say that is so absurd. I mean, who gives a shit when you when we in Germany now, I'm not getting tested anymore. If I have a flu or COVID, I don't care. You know, if I feel bad and have a little fever, I don't want to know if it's COVID. I don't care. It's like COVID is like the flu. 
and it was maybe a harder flu in the first in the first time of the uh, of the situation right it was easier going into your lungs and it was it was a more dangerous flu but what i want to say is i was never a conspiracy theorist like the people they said they put it on us they chipped oh, right, us right, right. Bill, gates, bill gates gates chipped us all that stuff what they all said the whole time that i was i, I always declared them for a total mentally ill and i'm three times vaccinated but i will not get ever vaccinated against against COVID. I will not do it. And uh, I know a lot of people, they have problems after the vaccinations. They have like, uh, um, they, they, like uh, the, the heart infections and stuff like this, you know? And uh, they, I don't think that the vaccine was tested enough. And in retrospective for what the vaccine actually did, it was not, the impact was way less as we all thought. In the beginning, when I got the first vaccine, they said, if you get boosted one time, you're done. It was like that idea that we're all getting two times vaccinated and we are immune for the rest of our life. Right. In, and then they uh, were like, we, you might need a maintenance in six months. Hey, you'll probably need another. You'll probably need it forever. Um, exactly. And here's, I, I will, I will. I forget in. to water my plants. I can't, like, keeping up with vaccinations. I mean, that's yeah, a bit great. of a challenge, right? I, uh, I, I just, I was hoping that since they developed that vaccine so fast that by this time after 2020, they would have had a better one that could like five years, 10, like tetanus, you know, like get a 10 year shot or forever. Um, because they got that one out quick enough. I was hoping that within four or five years, there would be like, Hey, this is it. This is all the science. It's been tested a billion times. These are like, just, could we get to that point? If we got that, that far, that fast, can we continue you know, like we, we, we really got far, but can we finish? And I don't see any, there's no attempt to finish because there's so much money in what they found here. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the thing. But I mean, I can only say people who now getting still two boosters a year for COVID, I don't understand them. I understand that if you're 80 or you have a heart disease or you have totally heavy diabetes, I said that I understand. But if not, then why doing it? It doesn't, you still get infected uh, and you still can uh, infect other people, even if you got fresh booster, right? So it only helps that you don't get the worst COVID you can get. So and that risk to have a maybe vaccine damage or something is for me almost now 50-50 with the benefit. So, and I don't want to do it. I know people that couldn't lift up their arm for half a year for whatever reason. Nobody could explain it. People had like this kind of, uh, the fingers were numb, the, you know, like stuff like this. I know a lot of people that had problems after the vaccine and the doctors yeah. constant said, it's because it's long COVID. You have long COVID. You have long COVID. You know, but in reality, nobody knows. Maybe half of it is long COVID. The other half are yeah, vaccine damages. Yeah. But of course, they don't want that Pfizer and everybody has to pay billions of, of dollars. They So they say it's long COVID. Nobody can do anything about it. So that they don't, that they're not liable for it. And and I feel um, that's exactly what, what you said is this kind of, we have to get out of, political blind you know i hate people they for, for example take the republicans right i mean if you if you don't see that trump is an egocentric like uh ex rapist pussy grabber whatever you know like i mean trump did a, he's a shyster he uh, he was never really super uh, uh, super uh, successful as a businessman you know so i think that has to be absolutely like crystal clear that he's not when he's always with that evangelical Christians there like crazy, right? They should know that he doesn't believe in God. He plays them like uh, uh, like a violin, you know, because he wants their votes. That is a hundred percent. But for me, that doesn't mean that he cannot maybe clear up some political problems better as the Democrats ever do. Right. You know, and the thing, is, the thing is, the one yeah. thing that I always try to put in people's minds are the president might be a leader, but he's not the only person. You have an entire two other arms of government that you have to rely on or hopefully rely on to get where you need to go. So it's about ideas at that point. That's why I've, we were talking about at the beginning of the show that I personally do not identify well with people who love a politician mm -hmm. or even a political party. If you love ideas, if you're passionate about this or that or i want you know climate change whatever your passion might be and your politics are informed by that that is 
amazing. But if you're like, I like this guy, to me, it's nothing but wrestling. It's professional wrestling. You have your good guy and your bad guy and your signs that you throw up and you yell at the guy when he doesn't do what you want to do. And you go home because you've been entertained, not because you've made your country better. Um, that's the way I see almost any major political leader anymore these days. Uh, they get on TV to entertain you and get you know hired again. Uh, no, you have to, you know, like when you when I shot in New York, uh, when you when you go to LA, you have only Teslas, right? Because LA <laughs> is long and flat, and you have so many parking spots. And in every uh, big parking garage, you have hundreds of charging stations. So now we went to Brooklyn and shot the film First Shift. And you had no electric cars and no chargers. And it has to do with, of course, the dense New York situation. Where you want to put this? You, The people in New York park a lot of times twice in no parking zones. You know, like the you parked already in a no Been parking there. zone. And they close you down, you know, like uh, in a no-no parking zone, basically in the middle of the street for hours. So in New York, it's just no possibility in a way without 400 billion bucks to change this, that you have enough like uh, uh, charging stations. So and now you go from New York, go to Mumbai, go to Beijing. Go to like the third world everywhere where most of the people live. How you think when they have not even fresh water in India that they focus now on wind wheels and uh, uh, electro cars? It, it just doesn't happen, you know. And that is the thing. It's like like in Germany we have a, a green social democrat government, and do they they made our electricity and everything so much more expensive based on they switch to renewable energy fast right so but they didn't give us any money for it it's just like everybody has to pay it you know and it's horrible like there are people they make two thousand bucks a month and they had normally a hundred bucks a month for electricity now it's 250 and for them it's like a horrible disaster and there was no parish yes. it was like oh too bad for you we have to get green now here you know like so and that that is this arrogance of the west and uh, we cannot, even if in Germany is no CO2 at all, like let's say no cars more driving, no airplane is flying. We don't change the climate because we are only like 2% of the world. So if 98% in China and India and everywhere are like blowing the shit out of the, in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, pollute, keep polluting everything, China has, I think, 8,000 or 9,000 coal mining plants right and opening so, more yeah yeah but i mean i can drive with my electric bike like crazy i will not save the climate here so if we're not coming to terms worldwide about climate uh, uh like saving measures whatever then it's a yeah, total yeah. waste of time so you know because we will not change anything and uh, that th that's the thing what i feel also the politicians a lot of times they lie to the people and they say, look, if you pay all that money and you change everything, you go from your oil heating or gas heating away to we have this uh, that is uh, the thing you dig into your house outside, you drill basically in, and then you you get your own. It costs like fifty thousand bucks per house, but then you basically get the warmth from the earth that, that heats your water. But it's a big deal, you yeah. know. And they want they want that you that you put that now in your house, like the whole government in Germany. You do this, you do this, you do this, you know, and uh no like people don't want that and they stopped that law because people of course couldn't afford it you cannot go to the bank and get a, a line of credit to change your heating right now no heat pump, yeah. you, have to, you have to save the planet so you know but it's so bullshit because we, we will not move the needle without the huge populated asian countries it will just and not also there's about eight people per major metropolitan city that know how to do a heat well properly you know, like that's not like a widely taught skill around the world. Like, so if, if an entire country switched, how would it even get done without with a level of knowledge, it, it, like specialized knowledge out there? So um, yeah. uh, I did have three questions uh, from audience members. I did want to get to yeah. because they, they they put the time into writing them and I do want to get to them. Um, I love this conversation. Uh, I love the fact that I'm not the only person thinking a lot of these things. So thank you for bringing them up. 
um, even again, where we might not completely land on certain things. L look at us not fighting or, you know, like, um, I love that. And I wish more people in the world would just like, can we just talk? We don't have to have a God that we pray to that we say he's going to fix everything. We could discuss things and, and figure it out on our own. But uh, Zaz, you got the first question. Can it fit on the screen? Yeah, I'm clicking on it. Hey, that's a huge. Yeah, <laughs> this is a oh, sharp sorry. shifting of gears. Should I not do it this way? Yeah, it is. Sorry. Apologize. Uh, has Uva ever thought about cutting out the middleman and just directing a game? And if so, what genre and what would it be about? Yeah, you remember Tunnel Rats? We made a game parallel to the film. My Vietnam War movie, 1968 Tunnel Rats. And there is a game, but the game company went bankrupt during, during the development. They were from Hamburg. What? And uh, the game is only on Steam Valve. Like I think it's, it's somewhere online only. But they could never finish the Xbox, the PlayStation, because the whole uh, company went under. That is the thing. It's like you don't cut out the middleman if you direct the game. You know, the, the cut out the middleman means like you have to develop your own game. And there's a totally different thing as to make a film. So, yeah. you know, so yeah, it's um, that was a very negative experience for me. Yeah. Oh, man. We should do a play it's along those. Ass. <clears throat> yeah. With that? We should do a play along, get Uva and get online and play through the game on Steam live. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, sure you'll love your game criticism. No, I'm, I would never, I would never. And uh, maybe, well, hold up, give me one sec. I oh, think next I next question from I think uh, I, Jake. Is that it? What's that? Oh, this nope, is the that's one from Jake. Yeah, no, it's uh, I'm just you know failing at everything I'm doing right now. The problem is there's right. a character limit there, Hammer. So that's okay. Listen, let me read the first one while you work on this one. Yeah, uh, thank in you. House of the Dead, during the scene in which all the protagonists are finally taking the fight to the zombie menace, there are bits of actual game footage edited into the fight. The clips shown have nothing to do with the action occurring on screen. I've never seen this before in a film, and it always stuck out to me. What led you to this decision being made? And that's yeah, from Dan Storms. House of the Dead was my first video game based film. And uh, for me, I saw that in the theaters, guys, just the FYI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and I played it normally in the arcade only. Uh, you know, okay, I never yeah, same, it. same. I, yeah. I yeah, so once on Dreamcast, you shot, you shot the zombies, they always came with you with the axe and everything. Yep. And I felt to use this as like this kind of in between clips to go from scene to scene to location to location. And the, the big fight in front of the house was, of course, like a video game shot. We had all kind of, we, we had not only massive explosions, we had the Matrix rig with 200 cameras. We had like a turntable, what turned around. When you remember when the guys were dead in the House of the yep. Dead, we had them standing mm -hmm. on the scene and moving on like in the game. So and I felt that it's a cool idea to put that in the film. And then the reviewers flipped completely out on it. You know, like uh, the worst thing I remember that they wrote in various articles that it's so bad taste to do this. I think I was with this actually more uh, advanced as they. You know, like I, I yeah. think the the movie reviewers two thousand three when House of the Dead was um, oh my God. no clue from video games, no clue. Yeah. You know, and they just felt like that is ridiculous and uh, flip totally out. Okay. By the way, cool. yeah, and it, by the way, kudos for doing not only a, like a video game movie, but a shooter. We don't have nearly enough shooting. Like I love the shooting games with the guns that, you know, especially yeah. when they do the clack clack. It was a lot of fun. So uh, yeah. yeah, it's a huge fan of that. But uh, I started right. off on Operation Wolf and it's still one of the first arcade games I'll walk up to. So if there's a gun mounted to a platform, <laughs> like that's a yeah. fun game automatically. Uh, thank you, Dan Sorensen, for the question. Also, thank you, Jake Wilson, for the question. Before, we have Danielle. Um, uh, who, hi, Uva. When you were thinking about casting your film, do you tend to want people you work uh, to work with actors you have not worked with before, or do you like the, the idea of working with people you know? And I think that plays into your conversation about like uh, having them develop their character. Yeah, both. I, I had various actors I worked <clears throat> various times with, like Michael Perry a lot, Clint Howard, uh, and, Howard, yes, definitely. Yeah, and Christina Logan played Blood Rain and she played in Darfur. So when I know people and I have some part where I feel they would be good in this specific part, I hire them again. 
if I feel like, no, in this specific film, it wouldn't fit or whatever, then it's not like, oh, I want to give him a, a job or something, you know? And, uh, but I n never forget, of course, actors I worked with and had a good relationship with. Right. And then I'm eager to hire them again because I know it will be good. It will be a walk in the park. Yeah. Where you don't have any disputes. Uh, and, um, yeah, so... I, I did both. Look, Ray Liotta, I have twice, um, you know, and um, yeah. So. Yeah, I was. Just, yeah, I, I, I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm curious, like, because I see, like, Kevin Smith always goes back, you know, almost always, depending on the movie, goes back to his his stable of actors and friends, and he brings them along. And I just, I assume that is his mode. But when I see you, you do have an occasional person come back. Um, yeah. But like, I don't know, like, what I would do if I was in that, if, if I was in that chair, I was like, I really want to work with him again. What do I do to make that happen, or uh, or like the 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 whole uh, menagerie of childhood actors and actresses that I've always thought would be great to work with? Like, let's put them all in a movie. Let's get Diane Franklin from uh, uh, Amityville Two and throw her in a scene with this person. And let's see. I don't know how I could not make myself do that. No, <laughs> so but, uh, I get that question. In the, name, in the name of the king, right? So when uh, Burt Reynolds, uh, the agency basically pitched him to us because I thought I would never guess that Burt Reynolds would play the king in my film, so I would never have made him an offer. But we had other actors from the same agency, like Ron Perman and Jason Stessen, and so they said, what is with Burt Reynolds as the king? And I said, oh my God, totally. Yes. You know? so, uh, and that is the thing. It's like <clears throat> when, they, when they come, uh, uh, um, it's also a thing, I'm, uh, casting, I still don't really understand how this all goes, you know, because a lot of times you have agents, you feel they're total assholes and they will never even show the actor the project. They will just not right. do it. And, uh, you know, it's this, I have that all the time and I try to, to package stuff where you have the feeling that is so dead and I, I don't really have to make a real offer because they would totally pass on it. And, you know, and then you have others that are a little more open for ideas, you know. And then you have sometimes stuff where, like Postal, for example, I think the script made the rounds at that point in, in, in the agency. And so that, like, J.K. Simmons, for example, he, yes. I don't know how he got the script, but they contacted us. And they said, look, there's that politician guy. Uh, can that, uh, we, we, maybe Jackie Simmons would, would do this. So that showed me that Postal, in a way, had a little life inside the agencies okay. that they said it's so ridiculous that could be interesting at that time. Now they would say, oh, that is that care. You can never be in that film, Jake. Don't ever send us you, another script. You, exactly. <laughs> you, will, you will never work again if you play in post. So, uh, uh, but at that time, I think it was a fresh wind for them. So we got a lot of like Simo Cassell, uh, Vern Troyer, Dave Foley, whatever. A lot of people yeah. uh, were in it um, for relative small parts also, where you feel like... Especially Vern Troyer. Yeah. I mean, Vern Troyer was... <laughs> Was great, yeah. Gary it's Coleman didn't want to do it. <laughs> so, Sorry, I had and, to. And, uh, you know, and, um, but with other films, for example, take Ray Liotta on In the Name of the King, <clears throat> I had problems with Ray Liotta. It was the first film I did with him. I think he hated this kind of history, fantasy stuff. And then when I shot suddenly with him years later, where he plays a cop, uh, you know, there was no problem at all because he's yeah. so used to play this kind of crime films and whatever. So yeah, yeah. That was he, was, he was in a way better mood shooting suddenly the way smaller film as, as, a, as in the name of the king. It, I think it was just not his kind of film, you know, so it was all high maintenance. There. So, right, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Hey, I have one last thing. Uh, uh, Zaz has to, to get back off the kid and I have to meet my wife uh, to do something. But I did want to touch on this. Uh, you're a former restaurateur in Canada. And I want to know if, uh, as somebody with German heritage, if I find myself in Germany, where is the one restaurant and what's the one dish that I have to eat? Uh, in Germany. So we In Germany. Your favorite place. Where would you take me if I showed up at your door next week saying, hey, you invited me? Yeah. So you go to Kronenschlösschen. 
in Eltville. There is a, is a hotel, what looks a little like a mini castle. <clears throat> and it's right there where they shot in the name of the rose. The, in the name of the rose with Sean Connery, that monastery is right there in the little town too. And the great thing in the Kronenschlösschen, besides the mega wine cellar they have, is they have the German classics. They have Wiener Schnitzel, uh, you know, they have like half roasted duck um, with dumplings and red cabbage. So um, I love that restaurant. We actually go tomorrow evening because my kids want the Wiener Schnitzel. And uh, that was one thing in my Bauhaus restaurant in Vancouver, what we closed at COVID, basically, right, where, yeah. where, where there was our biggest seller but was because we made a real Wiener Schnitzel. You know, it's so, hard to get good Wiener Schnitzel around here. Yeah, you know, it's not easy, and it's like it's all about the breading, and you you cannot put it in the fryer. You need to put it in the pan. What what is been full because it's long and flat. You yep. know, so um, yeah, so that that there I would say because there you get the the wine region. You have the monastery, the castle, and uh, amazing. Um, the food is amazing. It's absolutely gorgeous out there, uh, Nathaniel. I just uh, looked it up, and I was just like, "Geez, man, that's that's about picturesque as you're going to get." Yeah, that's that, awesome. that is, I'm in. Yeah, we, we live here in the wine region in Germany. By Frankfurt, Wiesbaden, Mainz is kind of thing. The advantage here is we're 20 minutes away from the Frankfurt Airport, where you can go everywhere. But at the same time, like when I get out of my house, um, I'm in five minutes in the middle of wine mountains right so where uh, i can walk the dogs and so on it's very nice and i was tired of, of vancouver because of uh we lived seven years there um also because of the drug crisis yeah you know how our restaurant was the fentanyl there's like the it was it was really like zombies on the street and uh it it really got me because the restaurant was right there in the old city in Vancouver, you know, and when you have the feeling like we have a very good restaurant, but I mean, when I go to my parking lot, uh, you think you're in the walking dead and uh, that is, unsafe. <laughs> uh, you know, like it's unsafe. Also. Yeah. Also, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's insane. It's, ins yeah, and it's, it's like one or two for you. It's like unsafe for you is one thing unsafe for customers, unsafe for your staff. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. You know, like I get that feeling. Like, am I am I being a responsible leader at this point? One last question before we let you go. I want to know what you think is harder, uh, directing and everything involved around directing a film or running a restaurant. Running a restaurant. I you know what? You say that. It's, it's, very, it's actually very interesting. La uh, I, I when we were we were one week on holidays in Greece and came back yet yeah, two days ago and. I read a thing, a questionnaire from Roland Emmerich, uh, the Independent State Director and so on. And I know he had two restaurants in LA. And they said, what would you never do again? And he said, like, you cannot run a restaurant without being there every day. And uh, he basically, and I know he made the same experience in that moment where I read that line, the same experience to what I uh, made it's really like when we are there my wife and me like constantly for like one or two months more sales better service you know like stuff was running smooth and it worked stuff clicks yeah yeah but every year for example i said every year summer holidays we go to germany because i have family here too and every and my parents were alive at that point my brother friends and i said so as soon we left over the summer holidays the sales went down, alcohol disappeared, you know, like stuff like this. There was like that. The, it's the walk so away is walked away. Yes. You yep. know, it's, yep. it's like it's very tough to get amazing um, stuff. And uh, we had some good stuff, but you have also bad people. And they, you know, like as a guest myself, I'm a, I'm a picky guest in a way. You're right. So, and if you have one bad, you know, let's say you have three times a good experience in a restaurant and then you have one very bad one, you maybe never go again. And that's yeah. the problem with four restaurants, right? So it has to be on the point. And uh, I think the real good restaurants are mostly family owned, you know, where the, the, the chef is also the owner. The wife works in the front of the house. And yep. so they are working good. They make money. Every And everybody is like 
doing their job because they know they throw you ice cold out as soon as you're not doing it right. Yep. You know, so yep. that is how you have to do uh, how to do restaurants. You know, or you do something like McDonald's or whatever, where everything is standard. It's like just a machine, but that is not in a way a restaurant. It's just yeah. fast food. Yeah. So, it's but I, I think the family-owned businesses, the family-owned restaurants, yep. and um, they work. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I will always. I ran a website that rated and reviewed bars and restaurants for twenty years, and yeah. uh, Zaz. That's how I originally sort of met Zaz. He can verify that I never once published a review for Applebee's. I only yep. cared about the locally owned, the small, the small chain at best. Yeah. Everybody knows what Applebee's is. It's it's a calorie factory. It's not food. Um, whereas every <laughs> even even a bad mom and pop was better than a major chain. Uh, there's something yeah. unique, something daring, somebody taking a risk. Uh, hopefully, uh, yep. and I like that way more. So I get you, and I appreciate you trying it and bringing good German food to uh, Canada. And uh, I wish I could have uh, sampled some of it. But yeah, next time I'm in Germany, I'm going to follow your directions and go eat there. So. Thank you <laughs> yeah, so much. Here, you call me before we go to guest. Right? I so absolutely I, will. And hell if, you're yeah. in Pittsburgh, if you're ever in Pittsburgh or, or uh, the Houston area, let us know. If you need some extra people to kill on set, we're, we're, we're there for you. Um, I will take a <laughs> fake bullet to the head anytime for you, Uva. Uh, <laughs> we see. I really appreciate Go ahead. Uh, Sorry. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for coming on our show. It, it's been an immense pleasure. Uh, I cannot wait was, to see your new movies coming out. Fantastic. Uh, I'm glad you're back. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a great Thank evening. You. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye. Play us out, Zaz. Bye.